Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for being on Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? Already, I feel closer <laughs> to you. Already, I feel so activated. We have danced, we have prayed, and you have been such an extraordinary part of my journey, such an irreplaceable key on this journey of awakening for me. Mm. Um, you know, I'm sure you hear this so many times, but when I was 24 years old and my father had just passed away and I started therapy for the first time. And my therapist said, Emily, you must watch The Secret. You must watch it. And I watched it and I, I didn't just watch it. I consumed yes. it. I, I devoured it into every cell in my body. And and you, your frequency in particular was so pure, so radiant, so strong that it shifted something inside of me. Mm. What I believed was possible, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life changed through that first transmission. And I know that I am so not alone in that. I know there are millions and millions of people where you have done the same thing. And then I have had the honor of witnessing your majesty on the stage at Agape, bringing so many people together in this vibrant, ecstatic state of unity consciousness where they are all communing with the the one thing, the right. one thing, and therefore they can commune with each other. And yes. it's such a beautiful thing that you have created there. And then you and I have had the great pleasure and fortune of speaking and teaching together at yes. A-Fest where we've become, yes. dare I say, friends, at yes. least really good acquaintances. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I think a little bit more than acquaintances. <laughs> I think we're good. Yeah. Yes. And you blessed my baby when, yes. when I was pregnant with my son Jasper. And, and so to sit here in these chairs together, is such a delight, so much so that I remember texting you to invite you on the show, and I got on a plane, flew to Los Angeles, got off the plane, and you texted me back, and you said, yes, I'd love to be on your show, and I'd love to have you on mine. <laughs> and I stopped, I had to stop the car, because I was weeping, crying, wow. because it felt like such a full, full circle moment that someone that has made such a difference in my life, that I now get to call a friend, and now that you were so enthusiastically a yes, meant so much to me, and I'm so grateful to have you here. I am so grateful to be here. As a matter of fact, when I when I in, into my day and I look on my calendar to see what I'm going to do, I don't I don't project myself way into the future. I'm just present. Yeah. So when I looked and say, okay, what's my next podcast? I, did, I said, Emily, Emily Fletcher. Oh, this is good. You know, I was <laughs> yes. like, I, I got excited because <laughs> I was I was looking at some other things and I went into the notes. I said, who's this podcast? Why isn't everybody doing this? This is familiar to me. Oh, this is Emily. Oh, I said, oh, this is really good. I like this. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll drive the I'll drive the Topanga Canyon. Sure. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> I know it's a bit of a drive. <laughs> um, so as I was celebrating your accomplishments, I added, um, you know, it's author, speaker, teacher, movement leader, and now musician, because we just danced and activated ourselves to your music. And I and I also added stand-up comic. You said, how do I, how do you know I did stand-up? And so you might not remember this, but I was a baby, baby meditation teacher. Yeah, I just- It's a bomb theater? Yes. Oh my God. You yes. got up after I spoke or yes. something. Oh my God, I was God, right I after that. you. But the crazy thing was, I mean, you came out and you did this set. People were, like, first of all, I don't know that anyone knows that you do stand-up. I mean, it was amazing. Listen, <laughs> I didn't know I did stand up. <laughs> I mean, I knew I, I could do some things, but when I was invited to do that, mm -hmm. my brother John, John, and he said to me, Michael, I want you to do stand up and I'm going to have Jim Carrey do the wisdom talk. <laughs> I thought he was joking <laughs> all the way up until hours before the event. I thought he was joking. I kept saying, John, no, really, you want me to come do an evocation and speak? He said, no, Michael. I've seen you on your stage at Agape. You're funny. I said, yeah, but I don't try to be funny. That uh -huh. just happens. Uh -huh. He says, no, you're going to do the comedy. Jim Carrey's going to do the talk. And I said, oh, my God. So I looked in the newspaper. Uh -huh. That's where funny is because human beings are funny. <laughs> That's one word for it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I love that you're finding comedy in well, it. Well, <laughs> you have to. We're like, it's the divine comedy. Yeah. You know what I mean? We have these big cosmic beings that have contorted themselves into very little versions of themselves mm. and then having experience of condensed fear, doubt, worry, hate, racism, etc. It's not funny funny, but it's like it's a comedy that a mm. cosmic being could contort themselves. There is a cosmic joke in yes. there. Mm -hmm. So I read some things mm -hmm. and then I went on stage. And you 
I mean, I don't like the words that we use of like murdered it, crushed it, killed right. it. Like, why does it have to be so evil and violent? Right. Right. <laughs> right. You elevated it. Yeah. You inspired it. You had people laughing so much. They were so falling much. out of their chairs. They were falling out of their chairs. Yeah. And I think also because part of comedy is the element of surprise. So yes. no one was expecting you to do that. Right. And then they were surprised and then more surprised. But then for a little bit more comedy, I'm backstage. I'm supposed to go on right after you, which is, you know, intimidating to begin with, especially I'm like, I've just graduated as a meditation teacher right and and the, the stage manager says okay go and so I walk out on stage and I'm in the middle of the stage and then they start playing a movie on top of me like I, I wasn't supposed to go at that time yes like right. I had taken the wrong stage cue. manager <laughs> <laughs> like 10 years on Broadway messed up the cue right. and so then I just gave like my best showgirl like pageant wave and I waved and then I, I think I was they were riding on the wave viewer comedy uh -huh. but the audience thought it was hilarious and then when I actually came out at the right time it went it went great so <laughs> <laughs> nobody knows a mistake that's right there's just, no such thing as no, mistakes. no mistakes opportunities just, for all, improv it's all jazz yeah, yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so a moment ago, when I when I asked you the question, why isn't everyone doing this? Like, when have you had that moment in your life where you found something so amazing that you thought, why isn't everyone doing this? And I love what you said. Why isn't everyone waking up from their intoxicated sleep? Absolutely. So what does that mean? What's an intoxicated sleep and how do we wake up? People have developed such a habit of living in their smallness. Mm. They've actually habituated fear, doubt, worry, and separation, and then created defense mechanisms and compulsive behaviors to eke out some kind of happiness, counterfeit happiness to a degree. Ooh, counterfeit happiness. Yeah, within, this, with this, within this unawakened state. Okay. So it's like 95% of them is asleep. So they're unconscious, pretending or I wrote, I wrote a lyric one time called, we're walking asleep, mm. dreaming we're awake. Mm. So individuals are walking asleep, dreaming that they're awake, unaware they're just outside of their habits and outside of their mental plans. There is a world of beauty and love and ecstasy and bliss. It's in the realm of the unknown to their present paradigm. Yeah. And they have no idea that this is so. They're frightened to step outside. We have like a physical representation of that with our phones, right? It's like, this is the known, this is this small 2D reality. And we're so, like, as you're saying that I'm picturing Wally, the movie of everyone just walking around with their screens and their oh, yeah, moving yeah. chairs. And it's like, if they would just put it down and look at the sunset or look at each other and yes. see the miracle that's happening right now. Yes. yes. And so, so how do we do that? Like, how do we wake up from that intoxicated sleep? Well, I think that well, first of all, I believe that people enter into this doorway two ways, either through suffering and pain or through tremendous insight. Mm. Y y individuals are eventually going to walk through the door. Mm -hmm. Most people walk through it through pain, uh, through some kind of suffering that forces them to say, there's got to be a better way. Better way. Mm -hmm. Then some people have tremendous insight. They may be looking at a sunset. They may be looking at a tree and suddenly become aware that's a living being. That that's, thing's looking back. That's not just a tree. <laughs> that's just a being, mm. <laughs> you know. Uh, and then from there, if an individual has some level of curiosity, some level of curiosity that actually opens them up to some level of practice, then momentum will take the place of inertia. Mm. And of course, there's cleansing that takes place. There's confusion that happens. There's dissolution of the old that takes place. It's not all fun and games. <laughs> yeah, dying to who you were is not <laughs> yeah, the most it's fun. Not, you know, what happened? I wish I, I wish I hadn't done this. I liked my life before it started falling apart. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at some level, the ecstasy and the bliss of becoming mm. is more enticing than uh, the survival mechanisms that we have developed to stay within a limited point of view. Mm -hmm. And then we become real students. And do yeah. you think we can choose to keep stepping into creation, choose to keep stepping into the unknown and then avoid the involuntary death portal that nature might give to us to, to destroy the old irrelevance? Well, well, I think that choice being a function of awareness, mm -hmm. that's what choice is. When you expand your awareness, now you're able to choose. Before there's awareness, you react. So I think the choice is continual. Mm -hmm. It's a continual, which is why we practice. So you stay in that choice so that when uh, the death happens, mm -hmm. when the, the limitations begin to break up, 
when that holy caca begins to wait what's holy caca like, oh, oh oh i get it caca. i got it <laughs> i thought that was like a word i didn't know but i know that word caca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be- <laughs> begins caca. to rise up we become aware it's part of the process yeah you know and we we keep on moving forward mm-hmm. so that then fear which is all energy becomes excitement mm. and then as we keep taking baby steps and excitement becomes enthusiasm mm. so the same energy shifts from fear and excitement and then enthusiasm then we're, we're living a different life yeah and then things that used to be, we used to make a federal case out of when we're going through it mm-hmm. becomes it's just part of the process mm. i'm taking an inner shower mm. you know i'm cleansing but i'm not like i don't have to tell everybody about it now <laughs> in the beginning you gotta tell oh i'm going you through it journal about it, it. you gotta journal Instagram about post it. about you it do all of that after a while it's just like hmm I'm in a bad mood. It's Taking a, a holy caca. Yeah, it's holy caca. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what it is, you know? And yeah. then, and then of course, there are those moments where there are tremendous dark nights of the soul, mm. which I don't wish upon anyone, but everyone's got to go through it, Yeah, where you have a total um, break from your formal identity, and the new identity hasn't formed yet. So you're in that no person's land for a while, and it's... Yeah. Whew, scary Debi- scary debilitating mm-hmm. but you begin to realize that the darkness and the light are both alike to the presence the darkness is that undifferentiated wholeness it's not not formed yet it's the the womb of birth mm. and it, it has its own luminosity and then the light has its own luminosity and then you do not regret going through it it's yeah. like wow yeah, you don't regret going through it. So, so what is the fear? Like, what do you hear? Because I know you help so many people through many dark nights of the soul, many awakenings, many chrysalis into the butterfly. Is there a theme or a pattern that you hear from people that is like the predominant? Is it they're afraid they're going to get stuck in the dark night? Is it they're mourning who they were? Is it they're terrified of who they're going to become? Like, is it's, there? It's all of that. Yeah, you know, um, because it's an actual death, an ego death, mm-hmm. and then a. a we, we, we all suffer to a degree from an identity crisis. We've identified with structures, things we own, people we used to be, we have that. And so that, that is dying. We're afraid of letting that go because we don't, who we're becoming is unknown to us. Mm-hmm. It's in the unknown. So all of what you just said is true. And so if we can stay the course, if we can, there's something called remembered radiance. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a, a, a term that's coined by uh, Dr. Howard Washington Thurman, mm. great mystical theologian that I had an opportunity to meet and mm. be with. Uh, he called it a remembered radiance, that when you're in that dark moment, if you can just remember a little bit of the radiance that you had when you knew mm. that life was really for you, yeah. and then you walk in that remembered radiance until the change happens. You do not go into wishful thinking. That is, I wish, I wish I was somewhere else. I wish I was someone else. <laughs> I wish this wasn't happening. I wish I hadn't done whatever it is I did to bring this about. We stay out of wishful thinking, yep. but we stay in the moment. So what happens is as we begin to unfold from that moment, we didn't waste the energy in wishful thinking. So now there's more energy going into the birth of what we're becoming. And so how do we stay out of wishful thinking? Is it is it just truly bringing that presence into the now of like, I am in the goo that is dissolving this caterpillar into a butterfly and I just have to be with the goo. I have to be with this destruction and mourn it and grieve it. My definition of stress is the distance between where you are and where you think you should be, which yes. it sounds like that's wishful thinking. Absolutely. And so if you it, shouldn't be anywhere else, but where you are. Right. That's the only option. Yeah. And so are you saying that like the more energy we can put into the now, the more energy we have to catapult us into that birthing into the new? Right. I, I, what is helpful is that if we can have a modicum of attention And we just look at all the things that are being said in our mind. And then we begin to be aware that we are not saying those things. Mm. That's the old structure. That's the ego. And as we become aware of what it's saying, oh, I'm dying. Oh, I shouldn't have done this. Oh, I wish I was somewhere else. You just look at it. You don't deny that it's being said. And you don't even deny the emotions that it may be bringing up in Mm -hmm. you. But to the degree, through practice, that we just watch it without trying to do anything, 
then that quickens the unfoldment. I mean, I was I was in a dark night recently. Thank you for sharing that, because I'm quite sure so many people look at you and think, yeah. oh, he's been through that. He's done his work. And so thank you for sharing that it's recent. And It was recent. It was 2023. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it was debilitating. Mm. Um, it was tiring. I still had the ability and the facility to go into a space when I needed to speak or teach. But when I wasn't doing that, I went home. I just sat. Mm. I was still. Whoa. And interestingly enough, temporarily I lost two friends because they didn't have access to me. They were, I don't, I don't feel you. You're not responding back to me. Uh, and I'm trying to say, this isn't a personal thing. I, I don't have any extra energy right now. Mm. I'm your friend. I love you. You know, I'll be there for you. But right now I have to take care of what's happening here. And so one individual called me and said, okay, I'm out. I'm not talking to you anymore. And it's like, it was breaking my heart. Oh. And the other person did something similar. But I didn't have any strength to go get them. Yeah. I just had to sit. Yeah. And then um, one of them realized that, you know, wow, Michael is growing through something. Yeah. He's normally here for everybody. Yes. You know, he's growing through something. And then she became very aware that I was not pulling away from anybody. I was pulling into Michael. Mm. The other one hasn't come back yet. The other friend. Yeah. Okay. He hasn't come back yet. But I, okay. I, But interestingly enough, I have dreamt about her every other week. And the dreams were so close. There's mm. so much love. There's mm. so much connect as, as we were in the, in the physical world. Yeah. So I still feel that. Mm-hmm. And at some point... I'm sure we'll we'll be good together. I just want to take a moment to honor you because yeah. the fact that you had the the self awareness, the bravery, the the honoring of yourself to do that, yeah. especially because you've constructed a life where I'm sure many people like quote unquote depend on you, or you maybe even sometimes source their light from you, and yeah. so to take that energy into yourself might have felt selfish, or what are they going to do without me? Or so many stories of the mind, and so I just want to really celebrate. Yeah. The, the trust that you had and the, the depth of your practice that was able to know that that was what nature was inspiring and asking of you. Absolutely. And it allowed me to see who was there, whether I'm flying high mm-hmm. or whether I need to take time for myself. Mm-hmm. Now, since that moment, I'm a, I'm a, I have more energy than I've ever had before. You really? Know? Oh, yeah. There's, there's another, more energy now than you've ever had before. More than I've ever. There's more whew, access. You know, I, I was watching myself speak Sunday. Mm-hmm. I had just come back from Costa Rica and I uh, flew in Saturday night. Mm-hmm. All reason should have said, you know, don't speak the next day. Just rest. Let somebody else speak. But I, went, I said, no, I'm going to speak. <laughs> so I got up that morning and the energy was just beautiful. I was watching it. I don't take response. I don't, I'm not, it's not personal. It's just like. I'm watching it. Do you mean in the moment? Yeah. Like there's a, another awareness yes. that's watching it happen in real time. I'm, I'm watching it flow through. I'm watching mm-hmm. the articulation. I'm watching the energy. The last service, I jump on the ground. I'm doing push-ups and <laughs> jumping up and down. <laughs> you know? And I, there was just more access. Mm. I can tell that as I move through that dark period, I have more. Ac- Michael has more access to real Michael. Mm. And it's it's beautiful. Not to say that I still, I probably still need to be in a little resting mold, which is my, my theme right now, is to manifest through rest. Mm. You know, just to rest is a nice four letter word. If you want to teach that course, I will sign up. <laughs> manifest yeah. through rest. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm really exploring that right now. Ooh. Just resting, being in the cut, but at the same time, allowing the next great vision inversion of me and whatever I'm supposed to be about to emerge without trying to make it happen, which I don't really do anyway, Mm -hmm. but just more a deep undulation of rest, but at the same time allowing the next version to emerge. Mm. And do you ever do that just quite practically as a a sleep practice, like hold your visions as you're moving into sleep? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when I wake up in the morning Mm -hmm. and when I go to sleep at night, Mm -hmm. yeah, I have things that I read. Mm-hmm. I have a, a, it's grown to about 18 things. <laughs> I have them on my phone. <laughs> but really? uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's personal, there's family. And these the, are dreams the, that you've written for yourself? These are community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, I've, I've synthesized them into little statements. Okay. And so as I'm going to sleep, I just read it. 
and then I'll go to sleep with that. Mm. And when I wake up in the morning, most mornings, not every morning, but most mornings, I'll wake up and I'll just read it. So it goes into my subconscious. <sighs> You know. I would love to adopt this. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It feels like such a powerful practice. And is yeah. that part of your life visioning? Is that what you would teach in life visioning? I, I teach it, not necessarily part of life visioning, but there's a state called the hypnogogic state, yep. that state between sleep and awake. Mm -hmm. And so you can really program yourself in that state. Well, that's what we're going in Ziva. Like that's this exact state we go into in Ziva meditations, which yeah. is why we manifest at the end of that, because yeah. you're still in that in-between, yes, in that liminal right. space. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's necessary that mm -hmm. a lot of people their mind will rush into their day too fast. Yep. They'll jump right on social media mm -hmm. or the news or something. Yeah. Something that they habitually do. But if you can just break it for a few moments. Yeah. And while you're still sleepy. And connect. Mm -hmm. And it, it changes you. I just was with a friend over New Year's and he said that every morning before he opens his eyes, he smiles. Oh, that's great. And I thought that was such a sweet, simple practice that just, and sometimes I forget, but I'm like, I close them back real fast. <laughs> and and I just I, smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do that, but I, it's more unconscious. It's like, I'm, it's like I'm happy. Uh, However, the, the biology of that is the moment you smile, your body chemistry changes. You start to produce tonic chemicals. Your immune system is enhanced. The coherence of the brain happens. Uh, the aging process slows down mm. just from a smile. Ah. You smile all the time. All the time. <laughs> just a smile. It's just like, ah. you know, give yourself face value. Smile. Uh, face value. I love that. <laughs> so speaking of waking up from in, in, from an intoxicated dream, I, I was just listening to your interview with Oprah, and you I did not know this about you, but you had an actual dream, like a lucid dream, which was a, a beginning yeah. of your journey. Would, would you be willing to share that yes, story? Yes, that was uh, my conscious beginning as an adult. I'd had things as a kid, mm -hmm. but I would quickly try to close it down yep. so I could be normal. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like a lot, a lot of great things happened, but I didn't want to be weird. So I would, I would shrink on purpose. Mm -hmm. So when I was, so when I was, I'm a, I'm a senior at USC, psychobiology major. Psychobiology? What's I was, that? I was, go, I was going to go to med school. Okay, got it. That but was, I still don't know what psychobiology is. Well, it was a psych combination of psychology mm -hmm. and biology together. Okay. So I was taking all the psychology classes. Mm -hmm. I was taking biology, chemistry, statistics, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of that. And I had a wonderful experience about that that maybe I'll share. But so I started to have these inner experiences that I labeled pathological mm. at the time because they weren't in the domain of psychology at that time. This is the 70s. Mm -hmm. And... So I thought I was going crazy. Mm. So the first thing I did was I stopped smoking weed. I said, this has got to be the cannabis sativus. It's, mm. it's doing all this. Mm. Experiences intensified. Whoa. I'm leaving my body. I'm astral traveling. And up to that moment, I didn't, I didn't study any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I could be sitting somewhere and I thought about my mom. Next thing I know, I'm in her kitchen. She's cooking. I'm watching her cook. Uh, is chicken. So I come back to my body. I call her on the phone. I say, Mom, are you wearing a blue dress? She said, yeah. I said, are you, are you cooking chicken right now? She said, yes. So I knew there's some validity. Whoa. So but this I, is, you're in college. Yes. You're not taking any of these courses. Just start spontaneously this is, this astral traveling. Opening. Wow. And that was happening. There's a lot of things happening. So then the other thing that was occurring was these three men were in my dream almost mm -hmm. every night. They were in a distance. But every night they were a little bit closer and, and I would wake up. So one night they were really close. I could see the outline of their faces. And I looked to my right and there was a small tent that had thousands of people trying to fit into this small tent. I knew every single person trying to fit into this tent. I knew them. And I said to myself, these men can't hurt me. All of my friends are with me. And then one by one, they turned, all of these people turned their back on me. Mm. Two of the men held me down, mm. and then one plunged a knife into my heart. It was serrated. The pain in my heart physically was excruciating. The pain emotionally was excruciating, and I died. And then when I woke up, I could see that we were surrounded by this presence of love. The love that penetrated my being was beyond, beyond. The beauty that was everywhere is just beyond description. I could see 
365, three, but not with my eyes, but conscious, I see everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everything is alive, vibrating. The lint in the rug was alive. Mm. Everything is alive. I woke up. I could never, as a kid, now, as an adult, I couldn't get back into that anymore. Changed my life. So I went on a research to discover what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I bumped into the mystical teachings of Jesus, Katama the Buddha, Zoroaster, Walter Russell, Howard Thurman. I, I bumped into Kuan Yin. I bumped into all these teachers. And so there was a period of time in my life when my teachers were all dead. I was communing <laughs> with, with people on the other side. And were you able to, like, were you astral traveling and communicating with I, them? I was, or they were I coming would, to me? One time I went to a class. I would go to this place. I was out of my body. I'd be in a class, sitting in the classroom, just like we're sitting here now. And one day I, I, I was in a class with this guy named Ernest Holmes. He was teaching metaphysics. And, and every day I'd wake, then I'd wake up in bed and I'd remember the class. So one day I'm, I'm, I'm watching this guy teach. And he says in the class, today the class is going to be taught by Michael Beckwith. He's going to tell us the nature of the universe. And I said, what? <laughs> I, I thought I was dreaming. So I walk up to the front of the class. I, I've never told this story publicly, I don't think. <laughs> and anyway... Um, and I said, well, it can be broken down into eight words. It is done unto you as you believe. And then I counted. It is done unto you as you believe. Eight! <laughs> and then I realized it wasn't a dream. And a bead of sweat rolled down my face. And I woke up in my bed sweating. And it took me a number of weeks to get back because I was so shocked. So a few years later, I met a metaphysical community, a, a, a religious science church. And I see a statue of Ernest Holmes, and, I, and I'm, I'm young, I'm in my 20s. And I say, um, oh, I know that guy. And the people look at me kind of weird. They said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, I used to go to his classes at night, and, and he would teach me. <laughs> at night. <laughs> and they said, this guy died in the 60s. You don't know him. I said, oh, no. And I was trying to explain. <laughs> and they looked at this young boy like, yeah, you're a little off guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but definitely, that was my awakening. Wow. And then... Um, I was a weird guy, you know, back in the day, and I lost all my friends when this happened. Mm -hmm. I understand, you know, uh, I was going through SC, I was financing my um, uh, tuition through, some of it was financed through me selling marijuana, mm -hmm. you know, I had a big industry that But grew. you're great at it. <laughs> I was such a good guy. <laughs> I gave good portions. <laughs> Anyway, I, I became aware. I, I, I got, you know, I got arrested on my last drug deal. Really? Yeah. I, I, I said, I, said well, I don't need to do this anymore. This is not my dharma. I don't want to be a drug dealer. I, it, back there, it wasn't legal, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in my living room, and I tell this guy, I'm not doing this anymore. And he says, Michael, you're so honest. Why don't you? I said, no, I'm not. This is it. And then something happened in my solar plexus. And I said, we have to leave right now. I left the house. Police pulled me over in the car. I didn't have any anything on me. And he said, where do you live? And I, I never had my real address on my license. I had my mother's address. I said, I live down the street. They said, you don't live over there? I said, no. That's where the marijuana was. Mm. I never had marijuana in my house except for this one time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, long story short, they found the marijuana, put me into the house. How did they find it if they, if they went they to your They knocked mom's? on every door on the side of that, side of that street. Illegally knocked on every single door, and then they knocked on my door. My girlfriend, that later became my wife, opened the door, and the marijuana was there. And they saw it. They said it's in here. They brought me there and says this yours. I said I don't live here. I don't know what you're talking about. They took me to the police station, handcuffed me, went and got a search warrant, came back, took me to the place with a fake search warrant, and arrested me. A fake search warrant? Well, it was. It was like. You know, not, it was yeah. not, it was, you know, they had found it already and now they were going to have a search warrant oh, right. to, to pretend invalid. they had just found it. Yeah. So anyway, this all happened, I was in county jail and I was so high. I was having a party in jail. I was just having a great time. Like not high on marijuana, but no, high on life, high, high on, on life. energy. <laughs> and the inner voice told me I was walking away free. Mm. So this is where everybody thought I was crazy. They say they found 200 pounds of weed in your house. Whew. They found guns, they Ooh. found all this paraphernalia. And I said, no, this is not my destiny. I'm walking away. So people just thought I'd lost it. So I go to court, we're having the arraignment. How long were you in jail? 
Oh, just, oh it got bailed out. Okay. In, in, okay. That, that same day. Okay. You know, my father's an attorney, came and bailed me out. Thank so, you, Dad. So, anyway, um, I'm sitting in court. I'm not even interested in the case. You know what I'm reading? <laughs> I'm reading the first pamphlet by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. It was called Chaotic, Chaotic Meditations. <laughs> he didn't have any books out at the time. He had a pamphlet. I'm sitting in the courtroom reading a pamphlet on chaotic meditation. The court, the, 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 the play is going on. And uh, we come back for the play many, many times. <laughs> and uh, so at one point, the assistant attorney was interviewing this police officer saying, why did you go to Mr. Beckwith's house? He says, oh, well, the informant, and, and this police officer wasn't even there. He wasn't even there. This is all a play. And he says to the police officer, why did you go to Mr. Beckwith's house? He says, well, the informant told us that a big drug deal was going on. So we meticulously got a search warrant and we staked out the house and we saw the delivery and we had the search warrant. We went to his house and we found the marijuana there. And the assistant attorney said, that's hearsay evidence. We demand that the informant come to court and stand in front of the accused and identify him or else we invite the judge to throw this case out of, out of the court. So this case out of the court. So the judge calls the attorneys and says, we want the informant here within three days or I have to let him go. So we come back to court three days later and the prosecutor says, your honor, the informant will not come. He is afraid for his life. And the judge says, Mr. Beckwith, I have no other recourse but to set you free. I hope I never see you in my courtroom again. I said, Your Honor, you never will. <laughs> and I walked out totally free. I have no record, nothing. And I went home. My neighbor's house had a weather vane. And the weather vane was pointing in the direction of the wind. So I said, to the presence of God, I said, if this means what I think it means for my destiny, I want that weather vane to point at me against the wind. Before I could finish, the weather vane pointed right at me. I started crying. Mm. I went to the ground on my knees. I cried like a baby and I surrendered my life to the presence. I said, do with me what you will. I surrender. And I left. I never drank, got high again. And then another miracle happened. If you want me to keep going, I with this sure story. do. <laughs> so, me and the mother of my child, we lived in a duplex. So, you know, there was sometimes a little traffic in my house, you know, even though I didn't keep a lot of stuff there. So, in the middle of the night, there was a fire that broke out in our kitchen. Smoke and flames were coming out of the kitchen. So, we grabbed my son and we got out of the house, called the fire department. The fire department came, they doused the flames. And so there was a, um, a you know, a, a yellow ticker, a, you know, banner around the house where nobody could. So I had to stay at my parents for a while while the insurance company came and, you know, make sure we could take care of the house. And, and what's the period of time from the weather vane to this moment? Are we talking months, years? No, months. Okay. Maybe a month. Mm -hmm. So finally the insurance company comes to, to assess the damage to see how much money they're going to give us to repair the kitchen the rugs and blah 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 so they go in to the kitchen there's not a sign of any fire uh, uh, nothing burned the only damage was from water from the fire department putting out the flames there was no origin of a fire there was definitely like smoke damage from something N nothing burned there was they said you had no fire here Yes, we did. Flames were coming out of the kitchen. We rushed our son out. They said, nope. So that was a holy fire that got me out of the house, stayed with my parents, got a brand new makeover from the insurance company. Wow. People thought I had moved. So those people who would want to come around and, and get, you know, cannabis sativas thought I had left. Uh -huh. So I had a clean start wow. with a brand new house paid for by the insurance company <laughs> from a fire that did never happen. You know. Wow, a purifying <laughs> fire. A purifying fire. Wow. So all those moments in my life expanded my belief to the impossible. Mm -hmm. So when people started coming to me for counseling mm -hmm. and th things of that particular nature, even before I had a license, I already knew that there were things that were possible that were not reasonable. Things that are possible that are not reasonable. Yeah, mm. just beyond mm. reason. Mm. Because I experienced it myself.
beyond reason yeah. is different than unreasonable. Right, right. right? Without yeah. reason, beyond reason. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow, well, thank you so for that was sharing my beginning. that story. That was the beginning. I think there's so many lessons in there, but specifically the fact that you are on trial in court yeah. and that you're reading chaotic meditation, that you are putting your attention on the thing that you want to grow. Right. And what is the eight words as, as you believe? It is done unto you as you believe. It is done unto you as you believe. So you weren't giving any of that your attention. You were putting your attention on the next chapter on the thing that is to come. Absolutely. It feels like such a parable for anyone going through a hard time right now, anyone who feels like life is happening to them. Yes. It's like, can you in that put your attention on where you're going without bypassing, right. right? Without like not feeling the dark night of the soul right. or like allowing those feelings right. to be real. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, as a, as a gentleman that makes jewelry for me, he um, called me a couple of months after his wedding. He says, I know you're not gonna judge me because I know a little bit of your background. He says, I got caught going through Texas with a trunk load of marijuana. They just gotten married. He says, I'm probably gonna have to do five years in jail because this is my second offense. He says, I want you to pray for my wife that she'll be okay until I get out. He gave me these very specific things to pray for. Mm. And I said, uh, no. I said, God doesn't know those kind of prayers. I said, God knows qualities like freedom, mm. love, peace, joy. I said, I want you to do an experiment with me. He said, okay. So I'm going to send you a Joel Goldsmith book. He said, all of his books are exactly the same, but they're different titles. <laughs> you know, I said, he's writing from fourth dimension. I said, I want you to read the book while you're in jail. Secondly, I want you to read the 91st Psalm. Three times a day, nine times in the morning, nine times in the afternoon, nine times in the evening. So you begin to be aware that you can live in the secret place of the Most High. The secret place of, of the, the most, most high. high. What does that mean? Secret place of the most high is living in expanded awareness. It's called, in the, in the scripture, it says, making the Lord your habitation. You're living in God. Mm. So I want you to read this, you know, 999, nine, nine, 27 times a day. I want you to write down what you're going to do with your life when you get out of jail. Mm -hmm. I want you to bless the prosecutor. Mm. I want you to bless the judge. Mm. I want you to bless your defense and then do not become interested in that world at all. They're doing their job. Prosecutor who's doing his job, the judge is doing his job, your defense counsel is doing your job, but that's not your world. Your world is what you're writing down as your vision mm -hmm. and living in the secret place of the Most High. So anyway, he finally goes to his arraignment and the prosecutor lost the paperwork. <laughs> the chain of evidence was broken. <laughs> The judge is livid. He has to set him free. They have 30 days to file, refile. Okay. He flies to Hawaii. They can't stop him from leaving because- it, They don't have any papers. They have, they have no paperwork. And so he flies to Hawaii with his wife and he starts making jewelry. Today he has two jewelry stores of, of handmade jewelry, you know, just very spiritual jewelry. That was what he had written down on his piece of paper. He wanted to be a jewelry, making spiritual jewelry to lift people's consciousness. They never refiled. And he went on to live a beautiful life. Well, you know, if this whole, you know, <laughs> teacher speaker career doesn't work out, maybe you could maybe be like a defense attorney because you have a pretty great record. <laughs> well, I used to tell people when they were going to court, I said, all I want you to do, and they took this down. It's not in every court anymore. Look up above the judge's head. It says, in God we trust. Mm. They took that down mm. in, in many, many chambers now. Mm -hmm. I said, that's all I, wear, I want your attention to be there. In God we trust. In God we just stay there. Mm -hmm. And then let, let the unfolding happen. Mm. Yeah. This is a teeny tiny little microcosm of that, but you might not know this. But as, as you were having tea with our, our friend Travis in the, in the living room, we were plugging in some heaters here and the, all the electricity went out in the studio. Cameras, microphones, <laughs> lights, all of it out. It's 102. We were supposed to start at one. Right. And I'm having some anxiety. Right, I'm right. feeling some stress. <laughs> right, right. I'm very aware you're a busy man. I'm very grateful for your time. <laughs> Oh, everything is now broken. <laughs> right, right. We don't know how to get the electricity back on. <laughs> I had no idea. Nope. I'm sitting there talking to Travis. <laughs> you're having a great time. <laughs> you're putting your attention on. You're doing your job. Right. And Rodney, our amazing DP, is in here. And I was like, um, I was like, how can I help? What can I do? And he's like, you can just chill. 
And I was like, this doesn't, chilling doesn't really feel like <laughs> my highest service right now. I'm not really feeling very chill at the moment. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, Emily? And we had, I just did a podcast yesterday with Dr. Kelly Brogan. Mm-hmm. And she talks a lot about male, female relating and right. how women try to always like, yeah. you know, get in there and henpeck when the men are trying to be the hero. And I was yeah, like, yeah. let me just do my job and like I'm just gonna drink this tea and I'm gonna go chat with Reverend Beckwith right and right. I went in I came in and chat with y'all and then I walked out and it was all great it was all great <laughs> it was all great <laughs> so in God we trust <laughs> yes it did happen <laughs> oh. <laughs> so those are my beginnings mm, yeah, wow those are the beginnings and then I imagine it's only been wilder and weirder and more magnetic and miraculous from there what do you say to people who like question manifestation or are skeptical of this? Or what do you say to people who are like, well, if if we become what we believe, like what's, what about people in the Middle East? What about all of the horror and tragedy happening in the world? Like, I just would love to know like how you respond to that. First of all, we stand in proxy for everyone on the planet. So we're to lift ourselves up into the frequency of love and unity so that that begins to be the dominant frequency right now. That's very difficult because every news outlet is giving us the lowest common denominator of the human experience. So we get a a sliver of reality Mm -hmm. from media. It's not total reality, just a sliver. So we're inviting people to break free from that and to come into an expanded space. That's That's our job as light workers. Now, when we deal with the things happening on the planet, We cannot, obviously this is a long, this is a big question you're asking. You know, we cannot judge by appearances because we don't know why things are happening. You know, we can look at the political ramifications of this and that and the other. But behind the scene, we don't don't know what's what's happening. Some people emerge on the planet and they already know they're going to go through hell, but they've chosen to go through hell to lift the consciousness of compassion. Mm. You know, and we know that. Um, for instance, there was a woman named Helen Greaves who was a, a nun, and her best friend was a nun. They meditated together for years, and they developed a telepathic relationship. They never had to speak because they'd been meditating together for so many years. Their conversations were, were very crystal clear. Mm. So when Helen's friend p- passed over, the conversations didn't end. Mm. So the lady told her what was happening to her, she got a new body. Her body was made of all the prayers and meditations and the energies that she had given on earth. So she had a very pristine, light body. Mm. She told Helen, Helen, that whole thing about no sex. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Don't. You still got time, babe. Said who? <laughs> Said who? And why? Thank you. So that's, a, that's an aside. Thank you. But what happened for <laughs> Helen is that she opened up, became clairaudient, clairvoyant, and she began to assist people. I'm, this, I'm saying all that to share this one story. There was a woman who was very wealthy, but her heart was closed. And she gave birth to a son that at the time the book was written, the son was labeled mentally retarded. But it opened up this woman's heart. Mm. She became so in love with her son that she found meaning in life. Generosity flowed. Philanthropy happened. Her son fell into the swimming pool when he was 11 going on 12 and died. Helen comes on the scene and could speak to him. Found out that he was an avatar, brilliant. He had taken the incarnation as a quote unquote mentally retarded child to open her heart specifically because they had known each other in many lifetimes. Mm. So it looked like why was this boy born like this actually was a choice for him to go through this to open her heart to actually change her life. So there are people in mass and people singular who come on the planet and it looks like, oh, why is this happening? Why is this Holocaust happening? Why is the African Holocaust? Why is the Jewish Holocaust? Why many people have chosen to take on that incarnation? Because you know, 50, 60, 80, 90 years, that's a blip, that's nothing. To go through that in order to hear, this should not be done again. We should not have child slavery. We should not have this to lift consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what we're looking at. And then there is um, individuals who were caught up in their ego. So pseudo power, greed from from a sense of scarcity, 
lack of limitation, there's control, there's wars, there's all manner of that from people who are egomaniacs. Most governments are run by egomaniacs. Uh, most governments on the planet. Mm -hmm. you, you know, every government wants to say, we're, the, we're good. We're the good guys. <laughs> most of it's ego. You, you'll find some statesmen, they're addicted to power. Mm. They're addicted to privilege. They're addicted to controlling people. Mm. And so at some point, every change that happens on the planet does not come through governments. It comes through grassroots, people who've risen in consciousness, mm -hmm. starts off with activists, and then people who grow from activists into being able to hold a vision, and actually be the frequency of what's trying to emerge. Be the frequency of yeah. what is trying to emerge. That's why we love Gandhi. Mm. You know, he started mm -hmm. off as a young man that was, he was crazy. He was a misogynist. He, you know, but he grew into this being that held the frequency of liberation and love until that's what occurred to break free from the stranglehold of the British Empire. Mm. You know, so you say, what do we tell people who mm -hmm. are looking at the, the, the holy caca on the planet? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, the earth is vibrating higher than it's ever vibrated before. She's alive. Amen. And she's inviting us to lift our vibration. Yep. You cannot lift your vibration if you're caught up in all that you can see. Mm -hmm. You see it, you lift your vibration, you bless everyone, mm -hmm. and you become the vibrational answer that's trying to be born right now. And there will be a tipping point where there will be a change, where we will study war no more. We will turn our plowshares, our, our swords into plowshares, and we will study war no more. Because right now, there's almost 8 billion people on the planet. 8 billion people aren't trying to go to war. <laughs> They're not hating. They're just trying to take care of their families. Yeah. The, 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 the majority of people want to take care of their families. The majority of people want peace. They, they want to live their dream. It's only a few people that profit af off the war, profit after armaments, profit after uh, uh, controlling people's food stuffs, but that's not the majority of people. Mm -hmm. So we have to get the majority of people who are intoxicated sleeping mm -hmm. to wake up to their glorious nature. Mm -hmm. And when that occurs, there'll be a shift in this dimension. I, I know that for sure. I feel that to be true, and thank you for saying that so brilliantly, so clearly, and so articulately so that we can really feel that in ourselves, that the yeah. frequency of the planet is changing right now, and she is inviting us to raise our frequency. And of course, there is going to be its own death portal. There will be its own dark it's night of the soul. Nasty. And it, it might get increasingly more intense for a little while. And so I feel like our job, as anyone listening to this podcast, is not to get caught up in that darkness, to not think that there we need to put our attention on that. Right. This is the play. This is the court. This is Right. the trial right we put our attention on what we want to be where we are going we raise our frequency so that we can start to vibrate at the frequency of the new earth the more beautiful earth that our hearts know is possible and become a tuning fork for that right. so that we wake that up in ourselves and in the beings of uh, everyone we come in contact with absolutely you know I, I i i try to inject into the conversation where people will be talking about the war congo rwanda gaza israel I try to inject into the conversation, what about imagining a world where there's no war? Yeah. Why, let's have that conversation. Yeah. Period. Yes. Not who wins, who's right, who's wrong, when who's did it blame. start? No. What about that conversation is not happening on any governmental level? No. That has to happen on a people level. Remember when uh, John Lennon had those shirts, T-shirts that said, um, war is over if you want it. Mm. He was assassinated after that. But um, <laughs> I have some. I bought some recently. Really? It says war's over if you want it. Uh, now, if people really want wars over, uh -huh. they cannot participate. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at uh, many of the senators, they're making a lot of money on stocks on war mm -hmm. and then voting for war. It's totally <laughs> out of integrity. Mm -hmm. But it's become normalized. Yeah. And people feel that they're powerless. Mm -hmm. But what about that conversation? Mm -hmm. We have to raise that conversation so that we're not killing people. We're not bombing people. We're, we're not, uh, my life is more precious than your life. Every life is precious. So the people that are in governments, they're bringing people into what is what, is what I call a hedge against mysticism, mm -hmm. which is pseudo-patriotism or nationalism. That is a hedge against mysticism. We are to grow out of nationalism and patriotism into an awareness that the 
the lines in the ground that are called borders have been forcefully drawn, driven, forcefully drawn by men. And right now, regardless of your nationality, color of your skin, sexual orientation, we're really all one, mm. emanating from the one source. Mm. Now, that's real. That's not foo-foo. That's, not, that's something I've seen. That's true. So as we wake up, we will all see that together. Mm. And it would be silly. We'll go through a museum <laughs> years from now. <laughs> like, you know, great-grandkids will say... You guys actually drop bombs on each other? You actually fought over religion? Really? Yeah, humanity was very ignorant at that time. Yeah, we killed each other over the concept of unity. (laughs) Isn't that bizarre? (laughs) Isn't that sickly hilarious? Doesn't it say in your scriptures, blah, blah, blah? Yeah, but humanity didn't really, they were were religious, but they weren't spiritual. (laughs) Mm, mm. And you've done such a beautiful job of bringing people back to spirit, of transcending the divisiveness of religion and bringing people back to the unity of spirituality. So I know you said like these borders are drawn by men. And I know that in, in the beginning, you were very, and still are very inspired by the teachings of Christ and Christ consciousness. Yeah. And I'm curious if, what your thoughts are on the, the Gnostic Gospels and the Gospels of Mary Magdalene and Mary Magdalene consciousness. Absolutely. And just where the, the role of the divine feminine is in this and, and how you think a lot of this outpicturing that we're experiencing right now is a byproduct of the removal of the feminine from the story. You've said it articulately right there. You know, when you actually look at the Apocrypha, What's uh, that? The Apocrypha are the, are the books of the Bible that weren't put in the Bible. Okay. Well, how is that different than the Gnostic Gospels? Well, they're not different. Okay. A lot of the Gnostic Gospels that have been found mm-hmm. have women involved. Mm-hmm. Yeshua ben Joseph, you know, Jesus, had women disciples. Mm-hmm. The feminine was very involved within that. Mm-hmm. And then the Catholic Church and other organizations systematically took that out. You know, so like you have uh, the scar tissue on, uh, with women is that if they get too close to being who they are, they will feel that they're going to be burned at the stake. The scar tissue of men is that they feel they're going to be crucified if they actually bloom into their greater yet to be. Mm. But with the subjugation of the feminine energy, we're in this issue we're facing today. And so the feminine is rising right now. You can't stop it now. There's efforts to try to stop, but it's too late. It's already, <laughs> the genie's out the bottle. Pandora's <laughs> box has been opened. Yeah. And the, the, the feminine energy is so powerful. When united with, particularly when united with uh, a mature masculine energy, the world will change. We're, we're involved in that right now. I'm really fascinated with this idea of of the divine feminine, the divine masculine inside of ourselves, like cultivating right that internal holy grail. It's right here. And I really believe that if we can create more of that internally, we will start to see more of that externally. And so how do you give people, I know you have so many people that come to you for counseling and guidance, but how would you start someone on that journey? Or how would you invite someone to, to union that masculine and feminine inside of themselves? I've, I'm, I'm, I'm right now, there's so many different counseling sessions that just move through my mind. <laughs> I remember one guy coming, and he was he was impotent, you mm-hmm. know, and and a big strong guy, you know what I mean. I, I said, I remember saying, I mean, do you ever embrace and just love your woman, or are you always just trying to, you know? It was such a foreign concept to him. I remember counseling a hockey player, and his communication with his wife was like he was on the ice. He was mm. trying to dominate her, mm. and so I can remember this bringing them back um, uh, to an awareness of when they were a child before they were enculturated into this hyper-masculinity of an athlete mm-hmm. and let it be okay for them to find their childlike nature, their, you know, I would say childlike, I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want to scare them away by calling it their feminine side yeah. at that time. Mm-hmm. I said, just, just, feel, just feel that. Just feel, feel what it felt like before you were uh, encouraged to be hyper-masculine, to win at all costs, mm. and to bring them back. And they changed. And then, then later on, I was able to talk to them about the blending of the masculine and the feminine, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And they fell back in love with their woman, but it wasn't to dominate, manipulate, or control. It was just to be with, mm-hmm. to support, to share, to shine, to glow together, mm. you know. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm on a journey right now of really healing my relationship with the masculine and the father wound, but then also for the first time ever, like, because I have a lot of masculine energy and I, and I like that balance inside of myself, but seeing, mm, 
seeing this like loving fatherly energy inside of myself, feeling mm-hmm. this loving husband energy inside of myself. Mm-hmm. And that has been new and very helpful. Yeah, um, And it's tricky because in a society where you don't want to be the like, bossy woman who doesn't need anything and is doing everything herself. Oh, absolutely. It's like, and yet to be a spiritual being, you want to be fully um, in and of yourself, union with well, the it's divine. Power. It's real power, mm-hmm. you know, it's real power for a woman to walk in a, in a deep sense of self-love and appreciation mm-hmm. of, of who they are. Mm-hmm. At the same time, yielding to the part of themselves that gives birth to more and more and more without trying to make it happen. You go from making it happen to making it welcome. That's a different That's a Ooh. different f- vibration. Go from making it happen to making it welcome. Yeah. Like you're allowing it in, yes. you're inviting it in. That's the feminine. It, it's mm-hmm. allowing, letting, surrendering, Receiving. yielding, which from the masculine side sometimes seems weak, but that's very strong. I mean, a womb, you know. Uh, uh, so, so the masculine is a seed planter you know, the feminine is the, is the great womb that allows for the seed to unfold. And we both have, we have, all have both within us. Mm. You, can, you have that idea, a vision, that's the seed, and then it has to grow. Where does it grow? Mm. It grows within us. We have to become the condition for the seed to emerge. You know, so we, we have to become the condition for the seed to emerge. Is that the same as like vibrating at the frequency yes. of your dream? Yes. To allow it to attract? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. There's a word that Emerson used, which was called endogenous, that we're endogenous beings, that as opposed to indigenous, like a palm tree is indigenous to warm weather. It's not going to, in our article, you're not going to see any palm trees. <laughs> you know, so there's indigenous, then there's exdigenous, exdogenous, I mean, where People are trying to get their good from something outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. But endogenous means you are the living condition for your dream. Doesn't matter what's happening in the economy. Doesn't matter what your childhood was. Doesn't matter what they said about you. You can actually become the condition for success. You can actually become the condition for that seed idea to emerge during times of a cycle of economic downturn during a cycle when everyone's catching the flu, you could, you become the condition. Mm. So that feminine vibratory womb condition allows for the seed to emerge. So therefore we're no longer victims. We become the condition for the emergence of the idea Mm. and nothing can stop that. Mm. Nothing can stop that idea because we're the condition. So, you, you know, you take an avocado, you put it in the soil, right condition, you have an avocado tree, more seeds. Pretty soon you have a whole row of avocado trees. But we are our own condition. We don't have to wait for an external condition. We can sit in meditation and prayer, be around high-minded, open, high-vibed people, and become the condition. And then the seed idea, the masculine, Within us plants that seed, we have a vision, we articulate it, we affirm it, we become the condition, it grows. And people say, how did you do that? You started with nothing. The the economic condition wasn't good, but you became successful. Everyone was sick, but you, you, you stayed relatively healthy. How? You were the condition for the unfoldment of the idea. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I would love to know your thoughts and feelings on so this new body of work I've been working on. We talked a little bit about on your podcast is um, basically teaching people that they can use uh, the most creative energy on the planet, which is their sexual energy, yeah. like use it to help to fuel the yeah. vision, the thing yeah. that they want to create, not only for themselves, but also for the species. And it's similar to what you're um, describing. Like the formula is very simply we visualize, we alchemize and we magnetize. Yes. We like hold the vision, <sighs> alchemize anything standing in the way. So giving people the tools to feel their feelings, to yes. like voice and give microphone to the rage and the sorrow. Yes. And then magnetize by building the endogenous pleasure chemicals in the body. Yes. And you're becoming that frequency of fulfillment and ecstasy and bliss. And then from that, like dedicating that energy to the dream. Yes. And so I'm just curious your take on that, if there, you have any refinement of it, any feedback. It's like you're actually becoming the feeling tone of the manifestation before it happens because mm-hmm. it, sexual energy and creative energy are the same energy mm-hmm. you know eros you know which most people think is just sex it's, it is good sex but but that, that energy is creativity 
So you have to have agape, unconditional love, combined with eros. Mm. You know, you can't have one without the other. So you have the love, the the, the, the unconditional, non-agenda love. And then you have the eros, you have that sexual energy that births creativity. And that's why we're here, to actually birth creativity, not just creation, but creativity, something new. Mm. Coming, coming through us. Mm. And then you're using pleasure to actually feel that it's already happened. Mm. And then most people don't get to this place. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm saying no, everybody gets to it. Um, is that you get to get into the bliss zone. Mm. You know, Because what happens is as you start to break free, you come to a fork in the road. On one side there's pleasure and the other side there's bliss. You choose bliss, you get pleasure. If you choose just pleasure, you might miss out on bliss. Ooh. If you choose just pleasure, you might become addicted. Uh. But if you s- keep surrendering and you go into that blissful state of unitive awareness with the presence, that's pleasurable. But you have freedom. And there are people that are pleasure seekers that just go for pleasure, mm-hmm. but then they become addicted to pleasure. Mm-hmm. And then if they don't get the pleasure, they feel anxious. Mm. But when you get to bliss, you don't have anxiety. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's... You keep doing your spiritual practice. I love bliss. I get bliss hits, you know, they go up my spine. It's like, ooh, you know. I used to drive people crazy in the early days because I couldn't control it because my the energy would just pop, you know. Mm-hmm. Now I'm more. It's That's like, happening to me now. I'm at the yeah. phase where it's like starting yeah. to like kick off. Yeah. And, like, I, and so I'm, I'm developing the mastery to be able to cycle it. But sometimes yeah. it's like popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what happens is that your body, mm-hmm. physical body and your subtle bodies, um, the capacity to hold more energy is increased. So then it flows through without jolt. Yeah. You still feel it. Any right? any tips on how I could increase my bandwidth? Well, obviously it's it's hydration. Mm. It's obviously it's good nutritious food. It's 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 yoga, it's qigong, it's everything that's going to increase the capacity of the body to hold more energy. Mm-hmm. It's like you go from ten watts to thirty watts to hundred watts to a thousand watts mm-hmm. by allowing the body temple to hold more energy, and that's all the stuff you already know. Mm-hmm. Are you hydrated? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you doing the proper exercise? Are you eating the right food for your body type? Yeah, you know all of that works to be able to hold more energy. Mm-hmm. So you can actually it, you go from ninety to a hundred watts to a thousand watts, and then what happens is there's a focus that takes place where you may not be uh, externally exhilarated, but there's such a joy inside of you. Mm. It's like a focused joy. Mm. And, and to other people, it may not look like you're in joy. You are, but it's just like a laser. It's just mm. like you're so happy for no reason. <laughs> or for all of the reasons. And for every reason. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's been helpful is that I'll imagine like a ball of, of light above me and a mm-hmm. ball of light below me and just allowing it to pass through. That's good. Just like let that current, like I just imagine the band getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, that's been, that's been helpful. That's very good. And then, then mm-hmm. what happens is mm-hmm. something happens and you have an awareness that you are that light. Mm. That, that, that's you. It's, 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 an, you know, not this past January, but last January, I was about to do a podcast, and I, I meditate pretty much before I do anything. And so when I, I opened my eyes from it, I was blind. I couldn't see. I was blinded by the light. I was in the light. The light was in me. It was infused. So I called in Reverend Kathleen Lee. I said, I can't see. I'm blind. You have to postpone the podcast for a minute. I, you know. And so I'm sitting there, and it's shh. It's just swirling i'm in bliss i can't see in this dimension however are you seeing light or does it look like black no it's light it's like total luminosity wow and i'm in it it's in me i am it and 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 this is i had had one fear thought it was like um when saul became paul saul went into the light when he saw the Christ presence. And you know, most people don't know that Paul never met Jesus. That was many years after, mm. but he had this experience. He was blind for nine years before he began to, to teach. I'm thinking, I can't have time to be blind for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought it went across, seriously, it went across my mind. Yeah. And so anyway. You bring that down to nine minutes. <laughs> so anyway, Kathleen is standing to my right, Lee standing to my left. I look in their direction and I can start to see now figures. 
and I see this fountain of light in them, like a like a, a, fount, a fountain, Shh, and it's light. I'm keenly aware that that's who they are. That's their identity. Mm. They have a body, they have a mental body, they have all these subtle bodies, but they are the light, mm. okay? So then it slowly come back, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. Now, I've been there before, but this is the first time that ever happened publicly, that somebody actually witnessed. I mean, I've been in that light before, mm-hmm. but no one ever, I was just, never. nobody's ever saw it. Mm. You know, I went, one time came back from a meditation retreat, went into the light, had all this information flow through, and I came out and told people about it in my living room. I thought I was in the light for an hour. I was only there for two minutes. <laughs> so I came running out with all this information, <laughs> and they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> That anyway, happens a lot in your life, I imagine. But, but I say that to say there comes a moment <laughs> where you have a, a realization that you are that's that's your identity, your light. Mm. You are you are energy, you are light that is conscious. You are conscious light. Mm. That's what you are. And we have these great disguises, we have these great bodies, take care of them. Mm-hmm. This is the light bulb. Mm. It allows the light to shine through this bulb so we're becoming uh, more effervescent, more luminous to shine the light of love and joy and all of that through these bulbs. So we are simultaneously the bulb and the light itself. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I've never heard that analogy. Mm. So it's a little bit of a gear shift, but a couple of months ago they did the first conference at Stanford University on UAEs or you know like unidentified yeah. alien, uh-huh. uh, uh, and then uh, you know the people are starting to testify under oath about they're having sightings of other types of beings, other been entities. Been going on for years. Yeah, I just got back from Egypt and saw some things that really blew my did you mind. See the, did you see this flying saucer in the in the in the pyramids? Yep. Well, well, I saw what I saw was Alpha Chi Omega mm-hmm. in the king's chamber mm-hmm. in the sarcophagus, which is apparently on the Arcturian ships. Yeah, and so I, I was also there with. But it's actually a, a grave oh, in the hieroglyphics. You can see in the, the hieroglyphs. Yeah. I didn't go there, but yeah. I saw my friend took a picture of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, so I'm just curious, like, what is your thoughts on this? What's your relationship with other entities? Like, do you work with them? At, like, what's your what's your thought on that? Mm, and, it, it, I think it's all possible. Mm-hmm. I've had my own experiences, mm-hmm. and I've had I have no people that are very close to that. Mm-hmm. You know, I can remember, uh, pro- I don't know, maybe ten years ago, I was I was in my house was, at night, and all of a sudden, my my house was full of light. There was no shadow right, even under the bed. And and you're not dreaming. This is no, not no, a lucid I was, dream. I got up, we looked okay. out the window to see what was happening, and there mm-hmm. was like something hovering there. Mm. And I called a friend of mine who works with different dimensional things. And he looked at it and he says, oh, that was an, an extraterrestrial. And he said, they planted something within you so that they can observe what's happening. They didn't ask for permission, so I'm taking it out. But he took it out of me. Mm. So then he said, there will be people coming in your neighborhood. They're going to be dressed as DWP people. What's DWP? Department of Water and Power. Uh-huh. And they're going to be placing things on the wires because they know this happened. In a short period of time, our place was full of all, all these people that had beards and they were placing these things to measure what had happened. And you can tell they weren't DWP people. You know? Wow. He told me what was gonna happen. I don't know how deep you wanna go into this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it's how deep you wanna go. <laughs> we, I used to work with a guy, he's passed over now, me and, me and a, group, a small group of people whose mother was an earthling whose father was an alien. Mm-hmm. And he worked with presidents for years. And he would call us in the middle of the night at times and say, we need prayer. This is going down on the planet. Mm-hmm. One time he told me through a friend that um, they were, there was a nuclear bomb that they were diffusing. Mm-hmm. Who's they? Like a government or an entity? No, or? these people were diffusing it. Okay. This this alien. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's just so much stuff going on. I know. I mean, I know. And look, anyone who's listening is like, what the actual what? I just want to say that like, this was, I was you one month ago. Um, it's a, so it's back a, to the question. Yes, there are other <laughs> beings. And there's a, there's a whole group of beings that will not allow nuclear proliferation to co- take place on the planet mm-hmm. because it's going to ripple throughout the entire cosmos. It's going to mess up a lot of people's backyards. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So there are beings like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but pretty much we have to choose our own destiny. 
destiny, yeah. but there are safeguards mm. from destroying ourselves. Yeah, I have to say for me, like going to Egypt and just being surrounded with so many people that have been deep in this world for a long time and having contact or channels or, um, you know, just a very different state of consciousness that I had been in previously. And then one month prior to going to Egypt, hearing a man who was a... Um, Mm. He's a geneticist, helped yeah. to form 23andMe. Yeah. He went to this com the conference at Stanford and his mind was being blown open. And we're talking government officials, politicians, scientists, doctors, like first sort of like legitimate academic conference about UAEs. And so I... <laughs> It's it's really I I'm so delighted to be 44 years old and have my entire construct of reality be blown wide Please, open. Please let it be blown out. Listen, I don't know if you know who Billy Carson is. Yes, okay. I do. You know, he he just, was on the strip. Yeah. Well, he, oh, okay. Uh -huh. He's a good friend. We're doing some things together. Cool. And, that um, makes me very excited. He gave an award to this gentleman who was a medical doctor. Ultimately, went into the study of you know extraterrestrials, and he works for the federal government. This guy works for the government now. He works with senators and congressmen, opening them up so that they'll start releasing all the technology that we were given by the aliens that are being held back by the elite. Mm. And that's what he does. Wow. As a living. Wow. And I met the guy. And um, so there's, there's all kinds of stuff happening. Yeah. There's also false flags, stuff the government does to keep us, Yeah. you know, Skeptical. oh, that's not real. Oh, that's real. No, whatever. Um, or and, be afraid. And what do you think it would take? And I, this is a, I know a baby fledgling question, but what do you think it would take for human consciousness? Like, how would human consciousness need to shift on planet Earth in order for other species? Because, like, the arrogance to think that we're the only living species it's is silly. so absurd. It's like silly. the billions and billions of galaxies and stars. Like, it's absurd. It's silly. So, what do you think it would take for human consciousness to shift on the planet in order for us to be, um, ready for, capable of, trustworthy of other entities, other beings to make themselves more known? Well, I think it's happening now. Mm -hmm. You know, more and more people are aware, as you've just said, you know, with the advent of the new telescope and the fact that it, we have the same state of conscious that happened when we, when people realized that the earth was not the center of the universe, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that there was so much more. We're, we're actually revolving around a sun that's in a solar system, that's in a, a galaxy that's, you know. So we're at that same space. We're about to have another leap. We're aware that there are so, so much life everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's a part, that's becoming a part of the knowledge of humanity. So once that becomes a part of the knowledge of humanity, we will see differently. It's just like you can't see outside of your own paradigm. Mm -hmm. Something can be right here, but you just don't see it, you know, because uh, I'll use a bad example of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, was, I was at a, a Silomar conference ground many years ago. A what kind of conference? A, a Silomar conference ground where we, it's a, it's a place. Okay. Where we do conferences. So I was at a restaurant. I was waiting in line to my turn. I was the only African-American there in line. So I'm, I'm next in line, and the lady walks by me to give the place to the person behind me. The table? Mm hmm So I, after, I say, excuse me, I was here. <sighs> she turned beet red. She was so embarrassed, she didn't see me. Mm. She had never been around an African-American. I was not in her paradigm. Mm. So she didn't even see me standing there. I wasn't, you understand? She yeah. wasn't racist. I just wasn't a part of her life. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. That's just, that's, that's, it's a bad example. It's a, I think it's a but, great but, example but, and it highlights like yeah. a really important relevant thing that we yeah. need to all like be expanding our paradigms around right, right. and interacting with all different types of people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there are things we can't see outside of our paradigm. It's, it's called paradigm blindness, mm. you know? So right now people can't see certain things, but that day is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. We will be able to see the possibility of other beings not just other ethnicities, but other beings that aren't necessarily earthlings. Mm -hmm. That paradigm blindness is being dissolved. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's exciting times. So why isn't everyone waking up from the intoxicating sleep? Intoxicating I, I sleep. like to think people are waking up. Uh -huh. it's, it's happening. Uh -huh. Some people are just, they're groggy. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, sleep too well. <laughs> you know how some people are when they first wake up, they're mad because yep. they don't want to wake up. Yeah. So there are people like that. Uh -huh. And some people have developed such strong coping mechanisms, defense mechanisms, and, and compulsive behaviors mm -hmm. to stay asleep. Mm -hmm. When it comes time for them to wake up, they'd rather overeat. Mm -hmm. They'd rather drink. 
They'd rather binge watch Netflix than their own thoughts. Mm. You know what I mean? And so that's keeping them lethargic. But after a while, people will get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. And they'll ask a different question and they'll wake up. Particularly since there's so many people waking up now, it's creating a different frequency. So yeah. it's going to become normal for people to wake up. Yeah. I mean, you go back, you know, you're, 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 okay, you're 44, you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. You go back 40 years ago, people would rather, if, if they were reading a book that would, back in those days, it was called a cult. If you're reading about law of attraction or you're one with God or affirmations, that wasn't a cult book. It was, people would put newspaper covering around the book. They didn't want people to see them reading that. They would rather say I'm reading porn than an occult book <laughs> 40 years ago. Really? You're strange. Wow. Okay. Secret comes out. 2008. Other books before that. Other things after that. Now you have millions of people that are talking about this kind of thing yeah. that didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. This was weird. Yeah. This was foo-foo. This was, ah, that's stupid. You know, if you can't smell it and taste it and touch it and hear it, it's not real. Reductionist materialist yes. scientism. Yes. <laughs> now, you know, that which can't be seen and that which can't be heard is more real than what you can touch. So the awakening is happening. Mm-hmm. Quantum physics is a thing. <laughs> you, know? you don't. You're like I don't believe in it. It's like, well, it's. Do you not believe in the color blue? Because it right. exists. <laughs> it exists. You uh -huh. know, there's there's a whole field of what your your eyes cannot see that's real. You, you know, you you, you can't see the air except in California. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to trust any air I can't see. <laughs> oh, it's funny and sad and true. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, so I think the awakening is happening, mm -hmm. and and you had little kids growing up now knowing they can manifest. Yeah, little kids. It's not. It's not. It's not like something they had to learn. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna close my eyes and I'm gonna see myself, you know, on the stage singing, or I'm gonna see myself going to the college I want to go to. You know, it's it's a part of the culture now. Mm -hmm. So now paradigm blindness is being lifted. Yeah. The the it's, it's interesting. You know the hundred monkey theory. Yes. Okay. Now. Most people don't talk about the first monkey. Mm. They always talk about the hundredth monkey. Yeah. The first monkey was And just was to a give the quick recap, the hundredth monkey is that there's two different, the same species islands. of monkeys, different places on the planet. and Not connected. Uh-huh. Unconnected. Uh-huh. One monkey started washing their yams or food. Mm -hmm. Instead of dusting off the dirt, they he was like, oh, let me go to the river, wash they it washed off. It. Then mm -hmm. the other monkeys followed. And then simultaneously, after, when it got to a tipping point, in consciousness of those monkeys, spontaneously monkeys on another island started washing their food. Mm -hmm. Same day, all of them at the Except same time. Except for, and this is when scientists break it down analytically, first of all, it was a female monkey. The, the hundredth or the first? The first. Okay. The first was a female. Mm -hmm. And the monkeys that never changed were, men, were the male monkeys mm. that were, were analytically equivalent to men who were over 60. Mm. They never wanted, they just poo-pooed the idea of washing their vegetables, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, the, so we're a part of the, the second or third wave of the first monkey mm -hmm. waking up, feminine energy rising. Mm -hmm. And now more the people that are being born into this, mm -hmm. what we learned they're coming here in they're coming in this frequency you know these they're being born the 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 frequency of the washing of the potatoes yes. is what we're being born into meditation is not a woo woo word yeah, I know. visioning is not a woo woo word yeah. visualization is not a woo woo word speaking your word seeking your affirmation declaring decreeing is not woo woo especially not in topanga right uh, but <laughs> <laughs> i started my house in topanga years ago <laughs> Uh, but but look who we have running most of our governments, usually men over 60. Yeah. So that's interesting. I didn't know that about the 100th monkey. Yeah. That feels like something that we need to examine. So when people say, do you want mm -hmm. this person, that person? I said, why do you want an 80-year-old person that doesn't know how to change, mm -hmm. that only knows the paradigm of living, to be your president? What are mm -hmm. you talking about? Mm -hmm. Let somebody else rise up. Mm-hmm. 
You want to share who you're you're in the campaign of? Not yet. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I know that's a whole ball of ball of worms. That's a whole. Yeah, <laughs> I'd have to get down to the complexities of it and this mm-hmm, and that. It's mm-hmm. like it's like it's just silly. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Plus, you know, the fact that we even pretend we have a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> what oh, is funny. that? Another joke. <laughs> Another joke. You know what I mean? I mean yeah. England has a greater democracy than we have, and they're not doing that good. Mm. You know, I mean, at least they they dull it out. If you get so many votes, the party gets so many votes. They divide it up. Okay, you get 13%. Okay, you get 13% represented. represented. Here's winner take all. Mm. It's, not, it's not a real democracy. And the gerrymandering. And, the and gerrymandering yeah. and the fact that a corporation... Is a, a, can be an actual individual and actually fund somebody's campaign. Mm-hmm. People used to go to jail for that under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's. Back during that time, if a corporation gave funds to a candidate, they went to prison. And now it is the thing that is running the and government. Now it's, a, it's, a corp, it's called a corporistocracy. Yep. Mm-hmm. You see? So that's a whole other thing. Yep. But as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, you know, the arc of the moral the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice yes yeah. so mm-hmm. love will always win mm-hmm. ultimately mm-hmm. that which is on the right side of the law will ultimately win we have to be consciously participating in that higher frequency mm-hmm. because it's going to ultimately out picture as a kind and just global society mm-hmm. and we are a part of that first monkey brigade mm-hmm. being the frequency of what ultimately emerge. And so what would you say to people listening to this podcast? I imagine most of them are waking up or have woken up. What would you say that they could do to take the next step or, or perhaps more relevantly, help the people around them who are ready to wake up from mm-hmm. the intoxicated dream, wake up? You know, when we look at the people we love through the ages, mm-hmm. they weren't they were exceptional, but they weren't exceptions. They were examples. So that which is called the second coming of the Buddha field, of the Christ consciousness, it's not gonna come through individuals anymore, it's gonna come through communities. Mm-hmm. It's gonna through people, it's gonna come through gatherings of people coming together and celebrating, dancing, singing, speaking, poetry, writing. Collaboration is the new sexy. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So what, what, what we're inviting individuals to do is to realize that the greatest thing you can do for the planet, for, I'll say to change the world because the planet's going to be okay, <laughs> um, for the species. is to actually become awake. Mm. As activists become awake and, and have more energy for something than against something, mm-hmm. as we infuse our artistic um, gifts with this awakened consciousness, Whatever our particular thing is, we infuse it with this expanded awareness, we become exemplars of the frequency, Mm. and we become a living tuning fork Mm. that helps other people vibrate at that level, first on an unconscious level, and then it becomes conscious, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's that's our role, to be a a conscious tuning fork. Mm. Amen. And then we're called into whatever action, based on our gift, Mm-hmm. Everyone can't do everything, but everyone can do something based on their gift. Mm, yes. How yeah. would nature love to use me? How yeah. would my unique gifts best serve the need of the time? Yes. Yeah. So we become, we wake up ourselves. We become a tuning fork so that people may tune to the frequency of the the vision, yes. whatever it is that they see of where they want to move. And then we allow nature to use our unique gifts to move us in the direction of the vision that we would hold. Right. Mm. And you have to make sure you're not, your energy is not against something more mm. than it's for something. Amen. It has to be for something, not just against something. Yes. Because when you're, whatever you're against, you're fueling. Well, we resist, persist. I yes. do find that, I find this again and again when I'm inviting people to manifest or pray that they, please let me get over this sickness. Please let me get out of this debt. Please let me recover from my broken heart. I'm like, stop putting your worries inside of your prayers. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't bring the condition into prayer. Yes. If you go back in the beginning, God, no condition. Uh, In the beginning, it wasn't even a grain of sand. uh, And then out of nothing, a cosmos, living biology came. So we're that same image and likeness. Out of nothing but an idea, we can birth a whole nother life. Amen. 
Reverend Michael mm. Bernard Beckwith, thank you so much. We covered a lot. <laughs> so much. We really, we ran the gamut. Is there anything you wish I had asked? Anything you were hoping no, to talk about that I, we didn't? No, I had I had no expectation coming here. <laughs> I just, just show up, see what happens. <laughs> oh, God bless you. So I am quite sure that people have fallen even more deeply in love with you. Where would you like to, for people to connect you? Where would you like for people to find you? They can find me. At agape, at agapelive.com. Agapelive.com. Oh, and that is a beautiful church and community yeah. you've created here yeah. in Los Angeles. And you live stream now. Live stream every Sunday. And mm -hmm. there's classes and workshops. They can go directly to michaelbeckwith.com. Okay. For my personal that's being upgraded right now. They can go back to the podcast that you were on. Yes. Actually, see our episode on yeah. the podcast called Take Back Your Mind. Mm. They can go to my Instagram page. I put something there every day, something inspirational every day. Wow, thank you. And then on my Facebook page or Agape's Facebook page, something there every day. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, I'm trying to use the right use of technology without getting caught up in it. YouTube, we have our own YouTube channel. Okay. Back with, you can see that services on the YouTube channel mm -hmm. as well. Highly, highly recommend that everyone listening to this takes the time to really subscribe and just like do yourself the favor of allowing this beautiful light being to infuse mm. yourselves with the grace and love that he has spent so many mm. decades cultivating inside mm. of himself mm. so that we can all tune to the frequency of the more beautiful earth that our hearts know is possible. That our hearts know is possible. Yes. That's true. I love you. I'm so grateful for you. I'm so honored to be here with you. And I feel excited that I feel excited for the ripple effect of what we've created today. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Oh, sweet friends, if you have enjoyed this episode as much as I have, I hope that you will share it with other people. If this has moved you or touched you in some way, then my prayer is that you spread this media as medicine with the people who you think would resonate with it. And if you want to screenshot it and tag us on Instagram, I'm at Ziva Meditation and you are at Michael, Michael Beckwith. Michael Beckwith. And we love you so, so much. And we will see you next week for Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? 